Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. My name is James DeFiori, and this is episode one of Blackballed. I am going to cut right to the chase. I am very excited about our first guest. He is a professor of linguistics and a political activist, and full disclosure, he's probably written more books than I've read. Um, but uh, let's not waste any time uh, introducing first guest of Blackballed, Professor Noam Chomsky. Professor, how are you? Very good. Good to be with you. It's good to be with you as well. Um, I'm just going to start by, we had a correspondence last year, a brief one, uh, over email where I asked you if it felt odd that you were uh, recommending, I guess might be the right word, that people vote for an establishment candidate like Joe Biden. And your response to me was, you said two things that I thought stuck out. One was that another four years of Trump would have been disastrous. I tend to agree. <laughs> and also that when Biden gets elected, the real work begins, quote unquote. And I'm just wondering, has the work begun? What does that look like? And what's the trajectory of that work right now? Well, I think it's a mixed story. On the domestic issues, I think uh, the activist pressures on Biden have been pretty effective. And the uh, program that he's instituted is not bad at all. In fact, pretty good. In the foreign, in the domain of foreign affairs, I think he's essentially uh, persisting with uh, uh, very dangerous policies that come straight out of the Trump administration and are not very different from Obama's very dangerous policies, which should be reversed. And domestically, I think it's pretty impressive, particularly when you recognize the obstacles. He's facing a Republican Party, which basically has one principle, uh, make sure the country is ungovernable, no matter how much harm is caused, so that we can come back into office by blaming the Democrats. It's not really very secret. Actually, uh, Mitch McConnell, the leading figure in the Republican Party, aside from Trump, uh, announced it openly when Obama was elected in 2009. He said straight out that uh, we have to make sure that he can't accomplish anything. Uh, that way we can find a way back to power. Country doesn't matter. And uh, you saw it very clearly on the first uh, stimulus bill, the nearly $2 trillion uh, bill that was enacted. Uh, Republican, every, every Republican representative is well aware that their own constituents are largely in favor of this. And in fact, they themselves are mostly largely in favor of it, but they have to vote a hundred percent against no deviation tolerated. If anyone in the party raises the slightest doubt, cast them out. Now, this is going to be a communist party style organization where the orders from come from the top and no discussion and no deviation is possible. Uh, we're seeing it you know, with Liz Cheney, saw it with Romney, we'll see it with others. And the party's completely in Trump's pocket, the voting base. And a lot of the money, because he's collected a, a group of uh, billionaires who were never much interested in politics before, but have been galvanized by his extreme right uh, racist uh, policies. Uh, just an article about it in the New York Times this morning. Uh, no, in Politico, sorry. Running through the list of donors that he's accumulated. Interesting list. So, and it's, uh, that's the obstacle that Biden has to face. And of course, there are some Democrats who don't go along with all of his programs. So that means... Uh, uh, you, you start with a 50-50 split and you lose a few Democrats and uh, you can't do anything. Now, he did manage to get the first stimulus through on the uh, 
reconciliation is part of the budget, but that happens only once a year, which means it's going to be very hard to get anything else through. I often come back to this overriding idea that much of the problems in in the United States and in Canada too, I think, at a lesser extent, is polarization. And that idea, that tribalism where if the other side thinks this, then we can, can't can possibly think the same thing. Um, am I overstating the problem of polarization or, or is that one of the main pillars of what's going wrong inside the United States? Well, it's, uh, it's not wrong, but it's that's the common way of stating it. But it's a little misleading. Uh, what's happened is the... Democratic Party, certainly the Democratic Party management, remains what it's been for many years, kind of a centrist uh, party. Its policies would have been called moderate Republican 50 years ago. Uh, the party base has moved slightly towards a more social democratic uh, stance. So there's a kind of a some degree of split between the Clintonite, Wall Street oriented, uh, professional oriented uh, party of Clinton and Obama and the popular voting base. On the other hand, the Democrats remain not very different from what they've been for a long time. What's happened is that the Republican Party to some extent since Reagan, but particularly since Gingrich in the early 90s and wildly under McConnell has just gone off into outer space. It's not a ordinary parliamentary party in any uh, normal sense of the word. This, of course, went turned into a caricature under Trump. So yes, this polarization, but only because one part has pulled off almost off the spectrum of parliamentary politics. So yes, that's polarization is not false, but it doesn't really capture what's happened. The, uh, actually two uh, commentators, highly respected commentators from the American Enterprise Institute a couple of years ago, described the new Republican Party as a radical insurgency that has basically abandoned parliamentary politics. And you see that in the adamant refusal to allow anything to happen, if even if it might help the country, even if they're in favor of it, as long as it blocks their return to power. You also see it in the, the dramatic efforts in every single Republican-run state everyone to try to block voting rights. This morning was just announced that uh, Florida has instituted very harsh rules to restrict voting rights. Of course, this means very selectively to restrict them in ways which will prevent uh, uh, blacks and Hispanics from voting too much or poor people. Try to ensure that the only people who are able to vote are the sector of our Republicans who in fact are a minority. Only way to win elections. Uh, it's happened in Florida to, to yesterday. It'll, even more severe laws are coming through in Texas and literally hundreds of bills are going through in Republican run states to try to sharply restrict voting rights. Uh, Trump is famous for the tens of thousands of lies, but occasionally a true statement found its way into the sequence. One of them was that Republicans cannot win in a fair election, which is correct. They've, they have a kind of a built-in advantage for structural reasons. Uh, could go into, but uh, every, the past elections, the Democrats almost always win the popular vote, but not the electoral vote. Are, are both parties in a totally different way, um, 
beholden to this the sort of sector of their base that is ideologically different from them i guess what i mean by that is i in my mind the chronology of where things started to get a little crazy was when the tea party was formed and sarah palin and i, I feel like there would be no donald trump if it wasn't for sarah palin um, but it almost felt like the Republicans sat down and said, oh, it turns out a lot of people in our base have really wacky ideas of what this country should look like. But let's feed them some red meat and and see where it takes us. And it took them to the White House. And the only I, I, I heard you say once um, about false equivalencies or moral equivalence is a term of propaganda that was invented to try to prevent us from looking at the acts for which we are responsible. And you said that in an interview about foreign policy, but if I feel like the message of that almost applies to the way that um, the parties have different views in the in, in the central power structure of the Democrats and the, and the Republicans that differ so wildly from where um, the sort of fringe elements of their base is at, and that they have to placate them, and then they always move to the center. How big of a problem is that? It's a problem, but um, I think there's a chicken and egg issue. A lot of it was stimulated by the Republican leadership. They've tapped poisons that are an undercurrent in American society. Trump was a genius at this, bring them to the surface, but it goes back much farther. Uh, Sarah Palin, you're right, she pushed it forward, but it goes way back before that. Actually goes back to Richard Nixon. Uh, Nixon, who was an intelligence strategist, uh, recognized that as the Democrats were beginning to support mild civil rights legislation, that gave Republicans an opportunity to move the Southern Democrats, the voting base, into the Republican uh, Party. Uh, 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 sector. Uh, the way to do it was by essentially being racist, not openly, not saying I'm a racist, go lynch people, but giving enough signals to indicate that Republicans will become the home of racism and white supremacy. And it succeeded. That was called his Southern strategy. It wasn't a secret. It was perfectly open. So the Southern strategy moved uh, Southern, former Southern Democrats into the Republican registry as uh, basically by uh, uh, using signals of racism and white supremacy. Uh, Reagan didn't even try to conceal it. You may recall his, he opened his campaign in a town in Mississippi, Philadelphia, Mississippi, which is known for only one thing. Uh, several civil rights workers were assassinated there. Uh, that was a clear signal. Then went on, on and on, all the way through uh, his little quips about uh, 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 women and uh, black women in limousines uh, coming to the welfare office to steal your social security money and so on. Uh, black studs who refuse to work because they can get welfare. All of this is, he himself was deeply racist, so it wasn't a pretense on his part. In fact, he was the last president, the last public figure to support South African apartheid uh, to the very end. Uh, he claimed it didn't exist. It was just a tribal war. And there were Zulus and whites and Bantus, and they didn't like each other. Uh, in fact, right at the very end of when the apartheid regime was about to fall, 1968, uh, Reagan's Pentagon declared the Mandela's African National Congress to be one of the mo more notorious terrorist groups in the world. Mandela himself couldn't travel to the United States for decades without special permission because he was a leading terrorist. Well, that was the Reagan administration and continues. You've seen it with Trump almost openly, just appeals to white supremacy, 
racism, what are called cultural issues. It's crucially important for the Republicans uh, to move uh, discussion and debate away from economic issues and class issues to cultural issues. The reason is, though the two parties don't differ greatly in social and economic policies, the Republicans are more dedicated to service to the ultra rich and the corporate sector. Uh, it became exaggerated during the Trump period. His only, every legislative act was a gift to the super rich and the corporations and shafted the general public. Uh, uh, the tax scam, the deregulation, the, the whole raft, every, just about everything. And also, and you can't approach voters that way. So they've been compelled to shift to what are called cultural issues. It starts with uh, Nixon, went on through the 70s uh, in interesting ways. So uh, uh, Paul Weyrich, leading Republican strategist, mid 70s, uh, recognized that if the Republicans pretended to oppose abortion, uh, they could pick up the huge evangelical vote and the uh, Northern Catholic vote. So th they suddenly uh, announced that principle. They all turned on a dime. Uh, Ronald Reagan himself had been strongly pro, what we call pro-choice. He's governor of California in the 1960s. He passed one of the strongest uh, legislation supporting women's rights to choose and so on. But they all shifted. Uh, first Bush, H.W. Bush, uh, uh, Reagan, uh, all of them. And now it's a point of principle in the Republican Party that you have to claim to be opposed to abortion. Uh, pretty much the same with guns. You've got to turn uh, the Second Amendment which never meant very much, have to turn it into holy writ. So every speech that Trump gives, it has to be defend your Second Amendment rights. In fact, it's uh, uh, then, of course, you attack uh, 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 gay rights and so on. Anything to appeal to the uh, traditional white, uh, white supremacist, uh, uh, Christian, conservative, uh, sectors and get them to vote on those issues. Meanwhile, devastate them economically and maybe they won't notice. Uh, that's been the Republican strategy since Nixon. It's kind of necessary. But they have to understand that they don't have much choice as long as they're going to be the party of abject service to extreme wealth and corporate power. And if they give that up, they lose the owners of the party. Uh, so in fact, uh, you have to give a, have a, a little bit of sympathy for people like uh, McConnell, not my favorite person, but just consider the situation he's in on uh, uh, the super rich and the corporations were willing to tolerate Trump's antics and vulgarity. They didn't like it, but they were willing to tolerate it as long as he was lining their pockets. January 6th was too much for them. And in a remarkably unanimous show of opposition, uh, major CEOs, the major business uh, 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 groups like the Chamber of Commerce, uh, on January 6th, they all basically came out very forcefully and told Trump, you're finished, gave him his marching orders. That puts McConnell into a very difficult position. He's beholden to the wealthy who own and run the party. But when he runs to the exits, as he tried to do, can't go too far because the voting base is in Trump's pocket. So he faces the raging mobs outside who are 
animated by concerns about things like uh, what's called the Great Replacement, uh, this conspiracy on the part of uh, Democrats, uh, elites, whoever they are, uh, to eliminate the white race by bringing in uh, tons of immigrants, by uh, giving special privileges to Afro-Americans and uh, the whole set of fantasies that you've read about. So yes, Trump has managed to very successfully uh, uh, accelerate, those, mobilize and accelerate those tendencies. So that's the mob standing outside. Uh, there's, uh, and McConnell is stuck between the owners, the donors, the ones who run the, play, the party and the voters who will do anything to defend their hero, Trump. Uh, we're seeing that right now. But uh, the shift off the spectrum for Republicans actually began with Nixon, who was, in fact, the last liberal president. By today's standards, his policies were pretty liberal. The Republican Party could never tolerate them. You, um, It's interesting because you, uh, I, I remember, remember Van Jones of CNN traveling to a Midwestern state before the 2016 election. And he sat down with uh, a, a Republican family who had been Republican their whole life, generation after generation. And w there was one soundbite that sticks out, and it was that, you know, the factory closed 10 years ago, I'm paraphrasing, but w when our democratic representation in the state came to talk to us, they were talking about things like pronouns. And that, and also the fact that there are a lot of voters, millions in fact, of voters who, if they had Bernie Sanders number one, they had Trump number two and vice versa. Is that kind of the spot, the starting point for maybe that glimmer of hope to sort of chip away at the establishment Republican credo? Definitely. I think you hit on a crucially important point. In the background of all of this and accelerating these disastrous tendencies is a war that's been conducted against the population for 40 plus years, not just in the United States, over most of the Western world and other places too, like India. Now, the war is called neoliberalism. Uh, it began with the late Carter years, took off with Reagan and Thatcher, expanded into Europe, uh, continental Europe with their austerity programs. Uh, now this was a program which was announced very clearly and was quite clear where it was going to go. So go back to Reagan's inaugural address. You may recall, he said, government is the problem, not the solution. Well, if government is not the solution, who is the solution? Decisions don't stop being made. They just shift from government, which is partially accountable to the general public. They shift from government to the hands of private concentrations of power who are completely unaccountable to the public and who have a uh, program laid out for them, in fact, by the economic guru of the neoliberal assault, Milton Friedman, came out with a famous article saying, the only responsibility of a corporation is uh, to maximize profit for, for its shareholders and its management, period. Incorporation is in fact a gift given by the public with many advantages. But according to this thesis, it incurs no responsibilities. So here we have a decision to transfer decisions away from government, which has the flaw of being partially influenced by the public. So shift from there to the hands of unaccountable private concentrations of power, which have no commitment to anything except self-enrichment. Does it take a genius to figure out what's going to happen? Uh, this was combined and 
the people who were doing the thinking, probably not Reagan, uh, but whoever was writing his speeches and telling him what to say, uh, understood very well that when you carry out a major assault against the population, you're going to have to eliminate the means of self-defense. There's one major means of self-defense, unions, labor unions, give working people, most of the population, chance to organize to defend themselves against the attacks by management and the state. So the first thing to do is destroy the labor movement. And in fact, Reagan's first moves were to attack the labor movement, even bringing in scabs, considered illegal everywhere except maybe South Africa. Uh, Thatcher in England did exactly the same thing, same policies, first move, attack the unions. And uh, if you look over the record, uh, the rate of unionization is very closely correlated to inequality for obvious reasons. As unionization goes down, inequality goes up. So here you have the package. Move major decisions to the hands of unaccountable private institutions whose only task is to enrich themselves and eliminate the means of self-defense. Perfectly obvious what's going to happen, and it did happen. Uh, you mentioned the closed factory. That's one of Clinton's contributions, uh, design, who then, who carried these policies forward as Obama did, uh, though not as an extreme form as the Republicans do. Uh, the international, uh, the global, the world trade uh, system of, uh, the world trade system that was established late 80s through the 90s is basically an investor rights system has almost nothing to do with free trade, highly protectionist, plenty of incentives to private power uh, to shift uh, manufacturing production to any place where they can make more money. If that undermines the American working class, none of their business, their job is to make, uh, make profit. And uh, they're helped with huge protectionist uh, devices, uh, patents of a patent rights that are of a kind that never existed before. In fact, a corporation like Apple, world's major corporation today, considerable part of its income just come from rents. Uh, China pays uh, rents on Apple's patents, huge source of income. Meanwhile, uh, the, uh, the computers, the, the uh, the, uh, the um, components are produced in China, run by a Taiwanese company. Profits go back to Adel Apple, where the design and the patents are. It's a large part of what the economy has become. Now, this has hit people hard all over uh, most of the population. We actually even have some measures of it now. So the Rand Corporation highly respected corporation, quasi-governmental, uh, came out a month or two ago with a study in which they estimated the transfer of wealth from the lower 90% of the population to the super rich during these 40 years. Uh, their estimate is almost $50 trillion. Huh. It's a lot of money and it's a very vast underestimate because they don't take into account the other measures that the neoliberal planners instituted to allow robbery of the public. Uh, one of the main ones is tax havens. Prior to Reagan, they were illegal. The Treasury Department enforced the laws. Reagan said, Everything's open, you guys just make money. So you have an explosion of tax havens, actually mostly under Clinton. Uh, so take Apple again, major the major corporation, pays very little taxes because it has offices in Ireland, Cayman Islands, Bermuda, Luxembourg, uh, 
British Channel Islands, anywhere you can move to not pay taxes. And of course, this institutes a race to the bottom because others are going to have to do the same thing. Well, uh, the amount of robbery of the public here is not known in detail because this is all internal to corporate offices. But it's estimated by the IMF and others as running in tens of trillions of dollars. So put that together with the $50 trillion of direct robbery, you have maybe seven or $80 trillion uh, robbed from the public middle class and working class in 40 years and put into the pockets of a tiny percentage of the population. Uh, the top 0.1% of the population has doubled its wealth during this period from 10% to 20% of total wealth, which is astronomical. Uh, well, that's the world that is the background in which a demagogue and con man like Trump can emerge and say, I'm your savior. I'm going to save you from these elites who are destroying your lives and towns who are closing the factories who are uh, shuttering the uh, the stores and uh, and the banks and uh, uh, leave, making your children leave somewhere else because they can't survive here in these formerly relatively prosperous rural communities i'm your savior follow me and i'm going to do it with uh, guns abortion uh, uh, I'll stop these immigrants who are coming here to carry out the great replacement. I'll get the colored folk back in the, in the box where they belong, so vote for me. Meanwhile, with the other hand, I'll stab you in the back with a tax program that robs you and puts the money in the hands of the people who are oppressing you. That's essentially the Republican Party carried to a caricature by Trump. I have to give him credit for that. A lot of what was pretty clear, but maybe latent, became transparent under Trump. Yeah, you know, it, <laughs> I don't want to belabor the Trump point, but looking at it from Canada, um, having Trump being respected as a leader by a big swath of your population and being so self-evidently a con man is I, I used to joke with my friends that it would be like me giving you hairstyle advice because <laughs> I don't have any hair. And, uh, and, and I thought to myself, when you were just talking now, the thing that came to mind immediately was the Panama papers. And I'm wondering, like when you were talking about tax shelters, how complicit, I, I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. How complicit is the media when you talk about, you know, the, the Panama Papers was like a big story and then it just disappeared. It's oh, like it right. never happened. I never hear anything about it anymore. Is, isn't is that almost evidence of a, of a complicitness or like a collusion between media, corporation and government? You're quite right. The Panama Papers was extremely important and it's uh, the major window that we have into the massive robbery undertaken through tax havens. Uh, and uh, you're right that it it's the major window, incidentally, because Congress is unwilling to use its subpoena power to get the true facts. Same with legislatures elsewhere. So that's all a form of complicity. As far as the media are concerned, they take their cues from uh, what's happening in centers of power. In fact, there's a slogan in the media which is not meant to be derogatory, which says the major task of the media is to report what's going on within the Beltway. The Beltway in Washington is where the centers of power are. Uh, the executive, Congress, Pentagon, that's the Beltway. So we report that something's outside that's not really news, that's bias. 
as long as we report what's in the beltway, it's not bias, it's objective. Uh, you learn that in journalism school. And it's kind of built into the system. So yes, it's a kind of complicity, but it's built in institutionally. And of course, there's more than that. If you look at the nature of the major media, what are they after all? They're huge corporations. Like other corporations, they sell a product to a market. The market is other corporations. They live on advertising. Uh, the product they sell is you and me. Uh, so you have uh, major corporations who are uh, selling people, readers, to other corporations. It's not hard to predict what's going to come out of a system like that. Of course, they're very closely tied to government. There's a constant flow between uh, media, top government, and so on. Government itself has a huge propaganda agency putting out so-called material. The job of an object objective reporter is to report whatever is said in the centers of power. And uh, if there's some critical voices somewhere, maybe you can mention them now and then, but they're biased because it's biased to uh, do anything that's outside the framework of power. So there are a lot of factors acting which tend to lead to what is a kind of tacit collusion, if you want, which I've written extensively about this, but you see it all the time. I was speaking with, uh, I interviewed Glenn Greenwald uh, a couple days ago, and we were talking about how, um, if you take an outfit like MSNBC, how Trump's presidency, as he put it, broke the brains of journalists. And what I found really strange is that, during, especially during the Bush years, uh, you know, Rachel Maddow and other personalities were rightfully criticizing, you know, the war and the policies instituted by <clears throat> de facto President Dick Cheney, I would say. <laughs> but all of the people that they used to criticize in intelligence agencies, James Clapper and others, are now pundits on MSNBC. And it seems so strange to me because they don't they they were ideological opposites for so long, and then Trump has made them allies. And it, it felt like a betrayal of journalism. Well, I should say first, I'm not an expert on MSNBC. Okay, fair enough. I don't watch it. Actually, I was on it for the first time in my life for five or 10 minutes about a week ago. Oh. So I don't really know much about it. But from the little I pick up here and there, it doesn't seem to me all that different from the clappers and so on. It's the Democratic Party alternative to the Republicans, meaning centrist, moderately liberal, uh, kind of like the, maybe like the New York Times, as far as I can tell. So they can easily move up and back. In fact, take the, Repub the Democratic Party itself, Biden's party. Take a look at the Democratic National Convention last uh, um, um, August, right? Uh, they, uh, uh, to show what a big tent they are, they invited a leading Republican figure to uh, speak at the convention. And he was greatly applauded, real fine person. Who was it? It was, it's an interesting, but it's interesting to look. It was John Kasich, former governor of Ohio. Uh, he's considered a great hero because in 2016, the last time there was a discussion among Republicans before Trump wiped it all out, at the Republican Party primary in 2016, uh, the major question in human history did come up barely, namely destruction of the environment, what's euphemistically called climate change. Every single Republican candidate, this is before Trump, every single one either denied that it's happening or said, okay, it is, but who cares? Uh, how about Kasich? What did he say? He was highly praised for being the adult in the room, 
highly praised by liberals, I should say, because he said, yes, uh, global climate change is definitely happening. We're contributing to it. And we in Ohio are going to use our coal as much as we want and not apologize for it. So in other words, he was the worst of all of them. The one who said, sure, it's happening. We're making it happen. It'll destroy the human species and many other species as well with it. But we're going to accelerate it because we can make more profit that way. So he's the liberal hero. And he's the one who was invited to speak at the convention to great applause. Well, that tells you something about how far apart the mainstream parties are, not the popular voting base of the Democrats, which is different. And you can see that. Uh, it takes a climate change in the Republicans. That's an interesting story. Uh, in 2008, Sarah Palin ran as vice president, but the president was John McCain. And McCain had a mild climate change plat uh, plank in his platform. Not great, but at least something. Uh, the Republican Congress, se Senate, was beginning to co uh, contemplate some moves towards uh, uh, programs to alleviate heating of the atmosphere. The uh, huge energy conglomerate, the Koch brothers conglomerate, as soon as they heard of this, they went into action. Uh, they had been working for years to try to prevent the Republicans from doing anything at all on uh, climate change. And here there was the beginning of a break. So they went into action full force, launched a major juggernaut to try to prevent this deviation on the part of the Republican Party, uh, bribing senators, uh, threatening them with primary challenges, uh, enormous lobbying campaign, uh, astroturf campaigns, you know, fake popular organizations uh, beating on doors and so on. Well, the Republican Party switched just as they had on abortion, just as they did on guns. They became a, a party of climate change deniers. Uh, Trump was extreme. He was the one who said, let's not just deny it. Let's race forward as fast as we can to accelerate the crisis. So let's expand the use of fossil fuels as fast as we can, especially the most dangerous of them. Let's eliminate the regulations that somewhat mitigate the crisis. Let's race to the abyss. Uh, all of that has an effect. You take a look at the voting base, what's happened? They pretty much follow along. This is what they hear from the leadership. This is what they hear from the echo chamber at Fox News that is their main source of so-called information. They don't hear very much different from MSNBC, maybe a little, even if they tune to it, which they don't probably don't. So you look at Fox News, you hear this story reiterated, you hear it from Trump, you hear it from every single Republican leader. How, what, what's the effect? Well, we, we see that. A couple of weeks ago, the major polling institution, Pew Research Center, came out with an incredibly significant poll. They asked people, uh, they gave them a choice of 15 options uh, to judge which is a major problem. So you rank them from top to bottom, divided into Democrats and Republicans. Among the Republicans, the lowest ranked problem is climate change. Climate change and sexism are ranked at the bottom 14%. Then go to the top. Ranked top are illegal immigration and the federal deficit. Illegal immigration because the Democrats are trying to bring these hordes of rapists and murderers over to carry out genocide against the white population. The deficit, because the Democrats are causing it. 
two days before November 4th, the deficit wasn't a problem. Reagan taught us that deficits don't matter. November 4th, flip the parties, the deficit is the major problem we face. All of that comes from the leadership, from the echo chamber, uh, from uh, uh, Breitbart, from Rush Limbaugh when he was still talking to his tens of millions of people. That's what this part of the population is inundated with. End result, they don't see any problem about uh, destroying the environment. They want to do it? Doesn't probably just a liberal uh, hoax anyway, or maybe a Chinese hoax. Uh, well, that's the world that people are living in. It's not very different in Canada. Just take a look at what's going on right now about the Michigan decision about the pipeline, or the reaction in Alberta when. Uh, Biden quite properly terminated the Keystone XL pro project. Uh, Canada is one of the worst offenders in this. Uh, so same problems. In, and it's not a small question. We are facing cataclysm. Every time you open the newspapers or the science journals, you find new evidence for it. So take a look this morning. Uh, long study was just released showing that the Amazon in the, they kept to the study the Amazon in Brazil that's about 60 percent of it has just shifted from being a carbon sink to a carbon emitter. Scientists were concerned about this but they thought it was a couple of decades off which gave us some time to reverse it. Turns out it's already happened. This is yeah. a disaster. I it's know that the environment is something that you're, I think, probably the most passionate about right now. Uh, you just recently did a co-write, <clears throat> Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal with Robert Pollan. And I don't even know how to approach this subject anymore because I feel like climate denialism is growing, um, like it was an intentional strategy. I feel like, you know, the average individual feels too small, you know, to do anything to help, which is probably incorrect, but that's, you know, that that's the feeling that's out there. How hopeful are you given the uh, policies, uh, governmental policies worldwide that, you know, the environment can, that we can somehow turn this boat around? We know how to turn it around. The book that you just mentioned, uh, includes uh, the most important part of the book by far is my my co-author Robert Pollan's contributions. He's done extensive work, not just theoretical, but work on the ground in places like Ohio, West Virginia and others, working out detailed explicit programs which are perfectly feasible, can be done within a couple of percentage of gross domestic product, uh, which would uh, not only get a handle on this growing cataclysm, but also create a much better world with better jobs, uh, better lifestyles, uh, uh, more livable societies, uh, all can be done. The methods are there and individuals can do a great deal about it. In fact, that's where the pressure is going to have to come from from people. So take a couple of dozen young people in the Sunrise Movement in the United States, group of young activists who've, one of the many groups that have been pushing very hard for this. They got to the point of occupying congressional offices, including Nancy Pelosi's office, Speaker of the House. Uh, ordinarily, they would have just been kicked out by the Capitol Police. Uh, not this time. They got some support from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, one of the young representatives who came in on the Sanders wave, which was again pushed by individual activists. Uh, she supported them, got the support of Ed Markey, senior senator from Massachusetts, been involved in 
environmental issues most of his life. Uh, the two of them got together. They just a few, about a week ago, they uh, introduced legislation into Congress, which could solve the problem. It's a very detailed program, pretty similar to Bob Pollan's, Jeff Sachs at Columbia, economists come out with similar programs. The Actually, the international uh, institutions have come out with very similar programs. We basically know what to do. So now the legislation's in Congress, thanks in substantial part to a group of young people who themselves were riding a wave of activism of a great many people, most of them young. Now that's where the pressure is coming from. Now, talk about collusion in the media. How much have you read about this? This is the major legislation which could save not only the United States, but the world from total cataclysm. If we don't do something like that, maybe it's hard to get a grip on, but if we go a couple more decades without instituting programs like that, we're going to reach a point where the earth is going to heat to maybe th three to four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. At that point, human life is barely possible. Uh, there'll be enormous sea level rise, uh, massive destruction all over, hundreds of millions of people fleeing, uh, much of the livable world un uninhabitable. This is indescribable. And we know how to solve it. So saying, well, I'm too small, I can't do anything, is saying, let's say goodbye to each other. Let's say to our grandchildren, sorry, I'm going to destroy you. You can take that position. We don't have to. There are things that could be done. No question like this has ever arisen in human history apart from the parallel, equal and parallel problem of nuclear weapons and the growing threat of nuclear weapons. You hear almost nothing about it. If you like, it's kind of collusion. Keep to what's within the beltway where they deny it, okay? Or don't talk about it. That's a possible choice. So let's, okay, so the Amazon is switching from one of the world's major carbon sinks to a major carbon emitter. That's permanent. Can't change that uh, for all practical purposes. We can try to arrest it, but it's not going to reverse it. Uh, what? Who's responsible? Primarily the current president of Brazil, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, who's a Trump clone, who's accelerated deforestation, uh, illegal cutting of limber for the benefit of his rich friends in the mining industry and the lumber industry and in agribusiness. Okay. We happen to have a collection of savage demagogues who've risen to power and who can destroy us and are doing it if we let them, okay? But to say, I can't do anything about it is first of all, flat wrong and to add a moral dimension, total moral cowardice. Yes, you can do things, it takes a little work, but can be done. Yeah, I, I mean, I often feel that um, government messaging is so timid that they just, you know, even the ones that, that seek public office as a way of being sort of, I guess, altruistic or whatever, they have a hard time with the messaging behind uh, global warming and, and, and they don't run on it. And I think that's a mistake. I think often the politics is the art of managing hypocrisy. That's a saying that I made up a long time ago because every time I see situations or issues as big as the environment become politicized, I often get confused. Um, you know, I'm a lay guy. I'm not an academic, but it, it seems to me that it's 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 the most important issue of our time if we want to live to enjoy the fruits of our labor and things like that. So I'm wondering what role does capitalism play, and is it, the, is it the dismantling of capitalism, which seems like an unrealistic proposal, or is it that capitalism needs a, needs caps, or they need to be, like, what, what's, what's capitalism's role in, in helping make the world a better place? 
Well, first of all, we should recognize that uh, business, the people who basically own the world, have always understood that capitalism is a death sentence. They've never permitted capitalism. They've always, the business world has always insisted on large scale government intervention to protect the rich and powerful from the destructive ravages of the market, uh, to carry and to massively subsidize them, to rescue them when they get into trouble, and to carry out the major innovation, development, research, which carries the economy forward. So it's a form of state capitalism. And every society in the world, uh, the Russians under so-called communism, uh, uh, China, the United States, uh, all one or another variety of state capitalism, because capitalism is literally a death sentence and it's well understood. You can't just enrich yourself and forget the consequences and expect to survive. But uh, uh, your question is very much to the point. If you take a look at my own feeling is that the there are elements in capitalism that should be totally dismantled. I think they should be dismantled, overcome in a more just participatory free world. That's one set of commitments. There's another set of commitments, which is, let's try to survive. Trying to survive very simply and accurately means taking control of the urgent crises quickly. Couple of decades to deal with heating the environment, no time at all to deal with nuclear weapons, could explode at any time. When Biden sends a naval armada into the South China Seas while Chinese bombers are flying over Taiwan. You have a situation that could blow up by accident tomorrow and lead very quickly to a terminal nuclear war. And we're playing with fire and that doesn't have to be done. There are diplomatic uh, options, negotiation options that could deal with it reasonably. Same on other issues. So there are things that just have to be done in a brief time scale. There's the problems about the nature of capitalism, which I think are critical and ought to be dealt with. It's a different time scale. As you say, it's not imminent by any means. So the solution to the early urgent problems has to be taken within the basic framework of existing institutions. They can be modified, reformed, you can move, you can be working towards more fundamental change, but it's simply a fact of life that the basic decisions will have to be made and implemented uh, while the institutional structure is not radically changed. We just have to live with it and move forward. And it's possible. These explicit proposals that I've mentioned are all within the framework of existing institutions, even by people like Bob Pollan, who agree that they really ought to be changed because we're faced with that reality. And there are steps forward. I mentioned the crucial legislation, detailed, careful legislation now sitting in Congress, which will die unless there's a lot of pressure and a lot of publicity. Uh, and there are also uh, on the ground, very encouraging steps. So just to mention one, which is of great significance, a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, uh, the head of the uh, United Mine Workers, Joel Roberts, uh, an announced that in the state of West Virginia, which is the main coal mining area, along with Wyoming, in the state of West Virginia, the mining union is interested in moving towards a transition program away from coal mining to renewable energy. That's a fantastic step forward. This is the center of opposition to doing something about global warming. And if the miners union is recognizing 
they can have a better life, they can have better jobs, better communities by dropping the dis destructive activity, which has been the basis for their lives and moving on to feasible efforts at renewable energy, reconstructing, a lot of construction involved, a lot of other things involved in rebuilding the environment. If they've made that move, that's an enormous step forward. Now, it didn't happen by accident. There's been a lot of dedicated activism working with them on the ground. Bob Pollan is one of the people who's been doing this. Uh, well, that's the kind of thing that can make a tremendous difference. We're in a race. It's either survival or destruction. That simple. And there's not a lot of time to lose. I read somewhere um, not too long ago that the U.S. military, just the military itself, was um, among the world's biggest polluters, even when you take into account, take into account nations. So foreign policy seems to be also a big, um, big cog in that environmental wheel. And I, I'm going to shift away a little bit from the environment, I think, but I think it all pertains to the same subject. I, you know, when you, I, I see, it's, it's so difficult to talk about things like the drone program, because when you try to make a simple argument, like, how do you think Americans would feel if China was um, using meta, cell phone metadata to kill American enemies and ends up killing civilians. I mean, that would be the greatest disaster in foreign policy ever. And, you know, the Americans would, would certainly go to war with China. But it seems like when the Americans do it and kill family members and wedding parties, largely under Obama, by the way, it's no one wants to talk about it. And that, that general idea of hypocrisy, um, seems it's so obvious to me it's it's like self-evident that it's hypocritical but you can't talk about that w why is that why is it so hard for people to talk about their own bad deeds we didn't invent it this goes back through the history of imperialism uh britain and france still have not faced the hideous atrocities that they carried out all over the world and are still carrying out in the areas under their imperial domination. They don't do it. We don't do it. Uh, we don't do it even on small things. Uh, the, the drone program is in fact a good example. I mean, if, if drones were flying over where you live uh, and you didn't know whether two minutes from now, uh, there's going to be an explosion across the street, uh, killing a group of men who are standing together because someone a couple thousand miles away think maybe someday they're going to try to harm us. Just think of living under those circumstances. That's living in much of the world under the Obama global assassination program, which in fact was expanded by Trump was bad enough over Obama, got even worse over Trump. Uh, well, just think what it's living like then. Would we go to war in a second? But when we do it, okay, it's fine. Same on everything else. Uh, take the invasion of Iraq, invasion of, uh, invasion of Indochina, killed millions of people uh, with Canadian complicity, I should say. Uh, destroyed the countries, uh, massive chemical warfare with enormous effects still, still taking place, still people still dying from it. Uh, it's, it's a little incident. Let's put it behind us. Who cares? Uh, same with the, I mean, it's happening constantly right in front of our eyes. I mean, I just had a interview, long interview, a couple of days ago with a group of activists, scholars, others in Belgium, where these questions came up. So take Belgium. Right now, millions of people are being killed in the Congo. One of the worst atrocities in the world. We, we don't talk about it much. It's actually the source of a lot of the minerals that you have in your iPhone and computer. Millions are being killed 
A large part of the reason of this is Belgium. Uh, when the Congo, the Congo had been devastated by Belgium throughout its history. It was a total horror story, the worst case of imperial savagery. Well, they finally uh, re achieved independence around 1960 under the leadership of a young, charismatic, uh, very effective leader, Patrice Lumumba, it's the biggest country in Africa, could have led the way to revival and development of the Congo and also revival of much of Africa because of its power. Belgium wasn't have any of that. They wanted to kill him and they did, they assassinated him. The CIA actually had a contract out on him, but the Belgians got there first. All right, that plunged the Congo back into a horror story, backed and supported all the way by the United States, Belgium, other Western powers with the Mobutu dictatorship following up till today with Eastern Congo being torn to shreds by warring militias, slaughtering people in the millions and handing over minerals uh, for us to use in our iPhones. That's today. That's not a couple hundred years ago. Do you read about it? Does the Belgian press cover it? Sorry, it's not our business. So yes, it's... You, you would think that there would be a reconciliation interest in Belgium, you know, Leopold II comes to mind, right? You'd think that they would learn lessons from history. Maybe I'm just really naive and idealistic, but no, I think the world is run by gangsters <laughs> and I don't know how. Well, how about us? Yeah. We tolerate it. I mean, you know, yes, the world is run by gangsters because we put them in power and allow them to function. And this is not just Leopold II, it's today. Lumumba was murdered by the Belgians who got there before the CIA uh, just 40 years or 50 years ago, plunging the place into further disaster. It's now, uh, we were able to use our cell phones because of that. It's right in front of us. Uh, the French are maybe even worse. Uh, they've destroyed Algeria, they destroyed Haiti, refuse to take any responsibility for it. Uh, the British are barely beginning to come to terms with even the basic facts of the crimes, the hideous imperial crimes of the empire. Uh, it's very easy to overlook what you don't want to look at and say, oh, well, that was in the past. It's not in the past. It leaves a legacy for the present when desperate refugees are fleeing from Africa and drowning in the Mediterranean today. It's because of what Europe did to Africa and is still doing to it. Same on our border, when children are being put in concentration camps, separated from parents at the border, uh, when Mexico is being bribed to keep them away from our border, they're fleeing from our destruction of their countries. Under Reagan, there was a massive US terrorist war, which devastated Central America. People are still fleeing from the wreckage. In fact, the United States was condemned by the world court for international terrorism, just dismissed it. Uh, well, right now they're fleeing to the border from the destruction that we're largely responsible for. So what do we do? Uh, we get all excited about the great replacement. They're coming to carry out genocide to the whites. We put them in concentration camps. We uh, violate international law by not allowing uh, uh, asylum. A couple of miles just to my south, I live in Tucson. Very harsh desert, brutal harsh desert. Uh, people are driven, the people fleeing in desperation are driven there because under Clinton, in order to deter immigration, Clinton closed off the places of easy access to ask for asylum. The idea is to drive them into such harsh places that they won't be able to survive if they try to get through. 
Well, they're desperate enough, so they keep trying. Uh, stopped by the Border Patrol. Uh, there are groups here in Tucson, uh, some religious-based, some human rights groups go out into the desert, try to leave a couple of bottles of water for people who are dying of thirst. Border Patrol comes and smashes them up. Uh, okay, that's happening a couple of miles from where I live. Well, there are people really working on it hard, seriously, going out into the desert, trying to help people, brought to trial for felony, uh, you know, uh, polluting by leaving water bottles around. This is happening. You can say the same things where you live. Everywhere you are, these things are going on. And we can say, I'm sorry, I don't want to look at it. That's one possibility. Yeah, you know, I, I sometimes I wonder what would a revolution look like in modern times, like we're living in. I, I always come to the same conclusion that a violent uprising will be squashed immediately. But is there a more of a is there a conception of a revolution that could take place that it that has a happy ending, or 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 would a revolution just require dead bodies? I know that sounds like a hyperbolic way of stating it, but. Well, first of all, if there's going to be a violent uprising, it'll come from the far right, from the militias, the guys who have arsenals that outgun the state police and so on. You know, that's where violence will come from. But uh, radical social change can come about just by our change. You know, we live in fairly free societies. There's a lot that people can do to modify, overcome oppressive, illegitimate institutional structures, make them more free and democratic, make them participatory uh, under popular control. There's no limit to what can be done this way if people are engaged in it. it takes dedication, engagement, personal cost, now, it's not the easiest way to get rich or to become famous by any means, uh, but there's uh, there are things you gain from it which are immeasurable. You can't put a dollar value on them. So yes, of course it can be done, just as climate destruction can be overcome. Uh, just as uh, I'm gonna take something as simple and straightforward as vaccination to control the COVID epidemic. The leaders of every country, Canada, the United States, Europe, all know perfectly well that unless vaccines are provided at cost, subsidized to the poor countries of the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, unless this is done, very quickly, the virus is going to mutate. It's already happening. New variants will come along. Some will be lethal. Some may be uncontrollable. They'll come back and attack us. We'll be devastated. Everybody understands that. How are they reacting? By refusing to do anything about it. By monopolizing the vaccines for themselves. Uh, you check me. Last time I looked, Canada, Canada was the world champion in uh, storing vaccines way beyond what it can use. Uh, how about giving them to the people who need them just for ethical reasons and even for survival for ourselves, even out of self-interest? Right now, what we're being told about vaccines um, just a quick recap, if you want one, uh, Justin Trudeau tried to make a deal with China, delayed a bunch of other deals with other big pharma companies. The Chinese deal fell through. So our vaccines arrived late. And then because distribution of those vaccines is a provincial, uh, mandate or whatever, the, uh, all the premiers now, but not all of them, but the conservative premiers are playing politics with vaccine distribution, saying that they don't have enough when they have freezer full of them. We're, we're actually seeing, as far as the Western nations go, we've, we've vaccinated the least amount of our citizens. Um, but that a lot of that has to do with politics. How about vaccinating 
Africans and Asians and Latin Americans. We're not going to be safe if, vac if the virus mutates there. Is that one of the reasons why, Joe, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but didn't Joe Biden just um, eliminate the IP protections for vaccines so that smaller companies could make generic versions? He's proposed that it's belated, but it's the right step. But unfortunately, there's a long way between proposal and implementation. There's going to be plenty of barriers. First of all, you can be sure the whole Republican Party will be opposed. Uh, comparable groups in other countries. Uh, the corporations themselves are going to probably fight it tooth and nail. Huge propaganda campaigns. Uh, might even resort to legal action. We don't know if this can be implemented. It should be. The COVID issue is also, strangely enough, brought up free speech issues. Um, our government right now is trying to pass B Bill C-10, which is like an internet regulated regulation bill to censor uh, smaller broadcasters and to put them, what they say, on a level playing field with traditional TV broadcasters. But it's largely seen by people like myself, like small time podcasters, as a way to sort of censor us, um, you know, and to give a gift to big telecom. But some people think it's a reaction to the disinformation campaign among some regarding COVID vaccines and the virus itself. And it gives us an interesting situation because I am probably militantly free speech. Like I, I, I believe that speech shouldn't be unfettered. I do believe that hate speech laws should exist, but otherwise, but how does the internet like play that role of being something so good for people, but also spreading such disinformation and influencing people to believe these outlandish conspiracy theories? How, how do we handle that? Well, I have the conventional answer, which has its weaknesses, but it's, the least worst answer that I know. You don't counter it by censorship. You counter it by carrying out intensive efforts at education, uh, helping people think through things for themselves, uh, work organization on the ground with groups to get them to work through the problems. It's the only way to do it on anything. You can't censor and block opinions you don't like. For one thing, it's wrong in principle, and for another, it's just tactically suicidal. It'll be turned against the weak, not against the powerful. Is that one of the mistakes that the left is making right now? As far as uh, what you can say, what you can't say, this whole cancel culture thing, uh, it's primarily coming from the left. Uh, you know, And I always thought, I always thought I was a progressive. <laughs> and then in the last 10 years, I've been told by really hardcore progressives that I'm not a progressive because I don't believe in certain aspects of how to communicate issues within the world of identity politics. I don't like that phrase, but I think that's for our viewers. That's what I would say. And um, I'm really disappointed in the left. Sometimes I get really disappointed in the left because I expect so much more from them than I do the right. You know, well, there are segments of the left. I wouldn't say the left. There are segments of the left that are uh, trying to imitate the worst policies that have been prevalent for decades in the mainstream establishment. Uh, cancel culture is nothing new. Uh, cancel culture takes place all the time in the mainstream. They cut out the voices they don't want to hear. Okay. I could mention my own personal experience, if you like. Uh, yes, I was going to ask you about that, because we are called blackballed for a reason. <laughs> One well, of the reasons is okay. because I've been blackballed from almost every editorial aid <laughs> office in the country. But, uh, go ahead. I mean, you know, it's even to the point where uh, a book, the first book that Edward Herman and I wrote, uh, it's now 50 years ago, was a book that was published by a small flourishing publishing company called Counter-Revolutionary Violence. It was a, a reaction to the charge that you were just talking about, that violence is something they do, not that we do. So we countered that in the book. The violence is mostly what we do. Uh, the publisher is owned by a mega corporation. 
executive of the corporation got wind of the book, got infuriated, uh, ordered the publisher to stop distributing it. When they refused, uh, he put the entire publisher out of business, destroying all of their stock, okay? Including our book, but every other book they published. Is that cancel culture? Uh, take another example. About, I guess, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I gave uh, the Massey lectures in Canada. Uh, they asked me to lecture on the nature of the media. So I gave the lectures on the media. A book came out of it. It's called Necessary Illusions, overwhelmingly about the US media. Actually, in Canada, it was a bestseller for a couple of months. In the United States, I don't think it's ever been mentioned. You know, it's right across the border. Is that cancel culture? Uh, I just said a minute ago that a few minutes ago that I was on MBC, MSNBC for the first time ever uh, a couple of weeks ago. The reason is they got a new journalist who's been uh, has been bringing dissident intellectuals into his uh, programs on other channels, and he was able to do it here. Well, not complaining about it. Sure, that's uh, they have their own politics. They bore anything that doesn't fit them. So it's rampant all over the place, mostly directed against the left, overwhelmingly against the left. Now, segments of the left are saying, okay, we'll do it too. If uh, somebody comes to camp, is invited to campus, whose views we don't like, uh, we'll drive them off campus. Great. That's not the left. That's the far right. And in fact, doing it is not only wrong in principle, but again, as in the case of other things we mentioned, it's tactically suicidal. It's a wonderful gift to the far right. In fact, it's a gift to the person you're driving off campus. They can now present themselves as a noble defender of free speech who's being blocked by the left-wing fascists and so on, wins a lot of points. Uh, Donald Trump can pick it up and run his campaign on it, which in fact he did. So it's a terrific gift to the far right and to the mainstream establishment. Uh, is there a right way to deal with it? Sure. Let the person come to campus, set up an educa counter meetings where you discuss not only the person, whoever it may be, but the issues that are at stake. Let people think about them, let them learn about them, and use that as an opportunity for education, activism, and organizing. In fact, if you do that, the person may very likely withdraw, uh, uh, refuse to come because they don't want to be exposed to that. That's the, the, the proper way to deal with situations like that. And the same is true across the board. You're not going to control uh, speech you don't like by force. That's First of all, it's not going to work. Secondly, it's going to turn against you. And thirdly, you don't want to join the mainstream establishment in actions of the kind that shouldn't be tolerated in the first place. So I share your feelings, but I think we should recognize the nature of these actions. I should say that's not new on the left. Now, there have always been segments of the left who are devoted to carrying out actions which are highly destructive to the goals of the left, uh, go through many examples back in history. The weathermen, right? That would be one, wouldn't it? The weathermen are a perfect example. The Vietnamese were devastated by the actions of the weathermen. They pleaded with them not to carry out those activities. I've been in, me I was in meetings like that 60 years ago, 50 years ago, where Vietnamese were pleading with them to carry out simple nonviolent actions because they didn't they didn't care about whether people young people in the united states felt good about themselves they wanted to survive and the activities of the weathermen were quite predictably building up support for the war 
you go down Main Street, uh, smashing windows. Uh, the people there aren't going to say, great, let's oppose the war. They're going to say, I'm going to fight people like you. Okay, that's what happens. They could see it. We tried very hard to keep young people from doing that. You could understand their motivation. Really good people, dedicated young people, overwhelmed by the horrors going on in Vietnam, said, it's not enough to carry out nonviolent activities. We have to do something real. Well, the things they did that were real were destructive to them, destructive to the Vietnamese. And the yeah. anger, it, during those times, the anger must have been palpable. But I, I'm, I was listening to, when I was preparing for this interview, um, and I don't know how your relationship with this individual turned out in the end, um, but Christopher Hitchens was introducing you at, I think it was a fundraiser for a small publication. It was in 1995. And he mentioned something that I didn't know, that you were um, you were at Fred Hampton's funeral. And w when I heard that, I, I got, I got kind of nostalgic in a way, even though I wasn't around during those times. But, you know, I, I, I've studied a lot of the activism from, from back in the 60s, and I feel like it's, it's strange because it felt like a cultural iconic moment back then, whereas now it feels super important, but it doesn't have that cultural sort of flair to it as it did back then. But either way, um, are there lessons that present-day activists – um, maybe let's, let's take Black Lives Matter, that maybe they could learn something from the people who were holding that torch, like the Black Panthers back then? Is there lessons that they can learn from them? A lot. The Fred Hampton case is a very important case. Now, that was a case of uh, a literal Gestapo-style assassination by the National Political Police could go into the details, but that's exactly what it was. Uh, the one, that one act, the assassination of Fred Hampton and Mark Cook, who was with him in the apartment when the police broke in, uh, uh, that outweighs all of Watergate by a huge margin. Well, it was the culmination of a major attack by the FBI against the black movements focusing particularly on the Panthers. They went after the best organizers and nonviolent activists. Fred Hampton was the best of them all, which is why he was picked. Very effective organizer in Chicago, doing really good work. Uh, they, so he's the one that they murdered after a long, no time to go into the whole story. It's a pretty ugly one. It was very, I think I did fly out for his funeral. I think I was maybe one of maybe half a dozen white faces in a huge number of, of uh, uh, black mourners for the Hampton assassination. Small group of young lawyers in Chicago, Flint Taylor, Jeff Haas, uh, worked on this from a small law firm worked on it for decades, finally got some recognition, even some small payments for the family from the police, not from the FBI. Uh, did Actually, Jeff has, has a very good book about it. If you want to look it up, it gives all the details. Uh, the left didn't pick this up. I mean, I we tried. They weren't interested in that, more interested in um, a lot of people in Witherman style actions or uh, pretending to start a Maoist revolution or something. Well, those are, but there were people who did. Actually, the FBI attack on the Panthers was just part of a much broader movement, uh, which actually started under uh, the late 50s, but really took off in the 60s. Uh, Cointel Pro, it was called. It was a program directed finally against the entire new left, uh, focusing on the black movements, the women's movement, others. Uh, uh, there's been nothing like it in American history. It's finally 
exposed in the early 70s, partly by Congress, partly by the courts, uh, but it has never become the major issue in American history that it ought to be. And the Hampton assassination was kind of the peak of it. It's uh, uh, so all of those are things that we should learn. We should also learn that with all this negative aspects at the fringes of the 60s, activism had a salutary effect on the country, greatly civilized the country. It's a much better country than it was before, thanks to the activism of the 60s. Civil rights, women's rights, opposition to the to aggression, uh, environmental issues, all of these things were broken up, broken open in the 60s and went on in subsequent years and have made it a much better country. And I'm sorry, but I see I'm running into my next appointment already. Okay. Uh, can I ask you one last question? Yeah. Um, and I know you, you seem humble and I know that you probably don't want to talk about yourself, but I, I, you also probably in your quieter moments have to admit that you're a pretty significant historical figure and you're still going strong. What do you want, and I mean this word not in the self-congratulatory sense, but what do you want your legacy to be? I think the legacy should be to pay attention to the people who I most respect and admire. People like Fred Hampton, people like Patrice Lumumba, people like the SNCC workers who were in freedom buses in Alabama trying to encourage a black farmer to face lynching mobs and go to vote. People on the ground all over. Uh, my friend, the late Howard Zinn, had a good description of them. He called them the countless unknown people who do the work that lays the basis for the great events that finally take place in history. The legacy should be to pay attention to them work with them to the best the best you can help them encourage them support them uh, work for the programs they're dedicating themselves to organize develop and implement it's the best legacy i can think of professor chomsky thank you so much for for joining us today we really appreciate that thank you thank you wow so I have a couple of things that I want to say about that. It's kind of surreal when you interview, you know, someone who, and I wasn't exaggerating, who, who is a historical figure who's still living and breathing. I mean, the guy has been around, he's been writing for 60 years. Um, he's seen everything. Uh, he was a child during World War II. I think his family immigrated here. I don't want to get that wrong. So someone fact check me on that if you want. Um, and then to sit down with him on my very first podcast and and hear him talk um, so fluidly too about all of these issues. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. And uh, this, guys, this is just the beginning. Blackballed has launched, and I will do my best to bring you as many compelling interviews as I can. Uh, so thank you, and have a good one.